Welcome to this week's Money Meadows podcast, helping gold and silver investors during these turbulent times. Now, here's this week's market wrap with commentary and analysis from the low-cost precious metals dealer voted best in the U.S., Money Meadows Exchange. Welcome to this week's Market Wrap podcast. I'm Mike Leeson. Coming up, we'll hear a wonderful interview with Frank Holmes, CEO of U.S. Global Investors. Frank talks about some key developments in the gold community and why he believes a key merger in the gold mining industry could be a good indicator of a market bottom. He also shares his thoughts about Vanguard's recent decision that leaves many gold investors hung out to dry. This is a must-hear interview with Frank Holmes coming up after this week's market update. Precious metals markets struggled this week against the forces of rising bond yields and a stronger U.S. dollar. Where have we heard that before? Despite these headwinds, gold is holding up pretty well as it trades around the $1,200 level and in a narrow range where it's been locked in for the past month. As of this Friday recording, the yellow metal comes in at $1,202 an ounce, up 0.7% for the week. Silver is off 0.3% this week to trade at $14.67 per ounce. Platinum is little changed at $825 per ounce. And finally, the palladium market is taking a breather after posting huge gains last month. Prices for the catalytic metal look lower by a slight 0.5% this week to trade at $1,075. As for the gold and silver markets, they appear to have based out and have the potential to break out this fall. Spot silver prices started to generate some noticeable upside momentum last week, but didn't get any real follow through this week, however. A pickup in buying is more apparent in the silver bullion market, where sales of silver eagles surged in September to 2.9 million. The silver market appears to be off to a strong start in October as well. The U.S. Mint reported 350,000 silver eagles sold on Monday, the first day of the month. That's almost as many of the coins as were purchased throughout the entire month of May, when bullion demand cratered and coin premiums dipped to near record lows. Despite the recent pickup in buying, premiums on popular silver bullion products remain relatively low, and spot prices remain extremely low, making this truly a buyer's market for the white metal. Customers who are new to buying physical precious metals often wonder how they might actually pay for them. It's not uncommon for a customer's bullion order to run into the thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars. Credit cards are convenient for smaller purchases, but they present problems for both customers and bullion dealers when it comes to big purchases. Credit limits, merchant fees, fraud prevention measures, and privacy concerns all add up to credit cards not being a viable way to buy a stack of gold bars, for example. Payment options vary from dealer to dealer. Here at Money Metals Exchange, we accept more payment types than the average dealer. We are an industry leader in accepting Bitcoin and certain other cryptocurrencies. But even in this digital age, an old-fashioned check or money order is often the most efficient way for customers to buy bullion. Unlike other businesses that deal in lower-cost, higher-margin products, the bullion business operates with relatively tiny profit margins. The only way we can offer coins, rounds, and bars with such minimal markups over spot prices is by cutting out credit card companies and middleman payment processors and their fees. Those customers who want to use Visa, MasterCard, or PayPal can still do so within certain price limits, but unfortunately we must pass on a 4% processing fee. And on that note, while it may sound strange for a company to charge for using a credit card, when you're buying gold and silver, you should be very leery of anyone not passing on the merchant card fee. If they aren't, you ought to be concerned about how much they're making on you. The entire credit card payment processing industry is controlled by just a few giant corporations that are pushing to create a cashless, checklist, all-digital economy. MasterCard colludes with Google and Big Tech to compile comprehensive data on customers' behavior. And Big Tech now colludes with Stripe and PayPal to screen customers for their political opinions. It sounds dystopian, like something out of a George Orwell novel, but the Orwellian future has arrived. People with unapproved political opinions, most often those on the dissident right, are being financially deplatformed by the likes of MasterCard and PayPal. People like bombastic pro-Trump talk show host Alex Jones are being cut off from social media and from the dollar-based digital economy run by Silicon Valley overlords. Not because they have committed any illegality or any fraud, but because their political opinions are deemed to fall under the arbitrary category of hate speech. 
This week, Alex Jones denounced he is suing PayPal over viewpoint discrimination against conservatives. Do I think my lawsuit against them is going to save the world? No. It's meant to raise an alarm to you, to we the people, and to the president who's already taken action against big tech and their censorship. This is really a dangerous draconian system where this global cashless society that surveils everything we do begins to persecute people for their political views and deny them access to the marketplace. It's a David versus Goliath battle, one that Goliath will be favored to win. Now that the multi-trillion dollar financial services and high-tech industries have set the precedent that they are in the business of taking punitive action against right-wingers, the intolerant left will push for corporate political repression to expand. One day, you might wake up to find your credit card or your PayPal account has been deactivated because you expressed a politically incorrect opinion on the Internet. For now, at least, it's still possible for the digitally deplatformed to walk into a grocery store and buy food using paper cash. But once cash is banned, as bankers, central bankers, and tech titans ultimately want, dissidents may have no other payment options besides speculative cryptocurrencies and tangible barter items such as silver coins. Well, now, without further delay, let's get right to this week's exclusive interview. It is my privilege now to welcome in Frank Holmes, CEO and Chief Investment Officer at U.S. Global Investors. Mr. Holmes has received various honors over the years, including being named America's Best Fund Manager by the Mining Journal. He is also the co-author of the book, The Gold Watcher, Demystifying Gold Investing, and is a regular guest on CNBC, Bloomberg, Fox Business, as well as right here on the Money Metals podcast. Frank, welcome back, and thanks for joining us again. It's great to be with you. Frank, it seems like escalating tariffs and trade tensions have been the major topic on Wall Street since early last spring. We continue to be a bit baffled by the market's reaction. However, the president has gone from posturing to serious action with another $200 billion in post on China a couple weeks ago. The equity markets aren't particularly phased near as uh, we can tell. It is uh, yet to move the needle on the trade deficit at all, though it is still early. But it is starting to show up in prices. I mean, we've been buying heavy-duty racks for our storage vault over the past few months, for instance. And on a recent batch, which we just ordered yesterday, the price rose some 10% from what they just were a couple of months ago. And the reason we were given was that the manufacturer is having to pay more for imported steel. Uh, You've called these tariffs a tax, Frank, and that's exactly what it is. Uh, Do you think the rest of America will notice much higher prices anytime soon? Well, I think that the tariff, the trade war, is able to do what it's doing short term because of the fiscal stimulus that took place last year with tax reform. And I think that that's why the market hasn't capitulated. Profits are still strong. We had a big run in small cap stocks, predominantly domestic stocks, and a small handful of big cap like Amazon uh, in the markets. But there's no doubt that the trade and tariff war is going to impact, and we see it on steel prices, such as if you're building a contemporary modern home today, you have to use more steel for the open space. And those prices, steel prices are up 35%. And so you start to run these numbers through, and you're seeing price inflation is going to come now with Amazon going to $15 an hour. You're going to see the CPI number ticking up. That's what I really believe that if we also looked at the 1980 numbers and the later on numbers for CPI calculations, inflation is running at 10%. So when they say it's you know, 2.4 or 2.7, I find that really difficult. I noticed in San Antonio, our avocados used to always come from Mexico, and no longer the prices are up, the quality is down. <laughs> so I do see that there's some issues on this trade war, but I don't think it's over the trade war, and I think it's going to get worse because there's a real strategy against China. Uh, In the renegotiated NAFTA agreement, which is over a 1,000 pages, there is some policy decisions there that if Canada and Mexico cannot go with a special pact with China, otherwise that whole agreement is thrown out uh, out the door. And uh, same thing uh, with South Korea, next to get Japan. There's a real push by the administration to go after China. Now, the positive part is that uh, Trump and his administration want to have zero tariffs everywhere and let the best athlete win. And the issue is with China is that they are double standards and lots of protectionism. And so that battle is not over. And they also con- the big concern is that China is trying to undermine the currency. 
and have an alternative currency. And that is something that uh, Munchen and Trump are, are very concerned about. You would normally think when you have such a high interest rate differential that uh, today we're seeing two-year, five-year, ten-year government bonds all above the CPI number that's reported. And when you look and compare to Japan, at 10 beeps for 10-year money versus 3.8, Germany, you know, Europe is, is 60 basis points. There's, a, 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 there's something not right there. And normally the dollar would be actually be much, much higher. Gold would be under $1,000. Uh, and the fact that uh, it's not is very constructive for the price of gold because any rollover in the dollar and uh, a slowdown this economic engine, which I think is going to happen next quarter, by the end of this quarter, we're going to get into what's called rebalancing of portfolios, and I think that we're going to have some real issues there. One of the things we're likely to need in order to give safe haven assets like gold a boost is a reversal of this seemingly never-ending stock market rally. Metals are often inversely correlated with stocks. Now, in terms of monetary policy and the Fed's plan to continue hiking rates, uh, one of the key factors that's been driving this bull run in stocks has been the ability for companies to borrow cheaply and reinvest that debt into buying back their own stock, which has created a strong demand for equities and, and thus pushed prices higher. Now that interest costs are on the rise and likely to be rising even more in the months ahead, do you anticipate this slowing uh, down stock buybacks? And might that be a key factor in bringing about this long-awaited pullback in, in the stock market? What are your thoughts there? Well, from a global macro point of view, I have great concern that the Purchasing Manufacturers Index, which is a six-month forward-looking line, has turned negative, and it's been negative for many months now. And China hit uh, 50, and just marginally under there for manufacturing. And that means their demand for metals, for manufacturing goods, is, is starting to dry up. And we're seeing the same thing in Europe. So global PMIs are negative, and that's not good for global trade. So the trade war battle is going to start showing up in the first quarter of 2019. So that's a big concern. Now, the other more significant mega trend that's happening uh, that's a great risk in America is this whole thought process that, that passive investing is better than active management. And one of the things I've always joked about is that we cannot offer you an inducement of putting $10,000 into our gold fund with a toaster. But someone else can come along and say, well, we'll waive all the fees to induce you to come into our index, and that's okay. Both are inducements, and one is accepted and one is not. And what we're seeing is this incredible inducement. And I've gone around and asked, is any law firms giving Vanguard free legal work for their indexes? Nope, not happening. Is anyone, any of the accounting firms giving them free audits? Nope, not happening. So how can they offer free? Who's paying? And this sort of trend in the past decade of free and growing, you've witnessed $2 trillion has left active fund managers and gone into passive indexing. And those stocks within that index, a lot of them doing exactly what you start off with your question, buying back their stock. Therefore, their float is shrinking. And when these pension funds, et cetera, they all go to rebalance as they did going from 1999 to 2000, there's no bids. They just crashed. And that just, just became more exasperating. So I think we're getting up for a big, big crash uh, in that stock market, that correction that's going to shock people, and uh, they're just not going to be able to find the buyers around. The other part is that 70% of all f trading now is supposedly quant funds. And quant funds look for different metrics than the passive investing. And other research is the number one factor now for picking stocks is not P.E. ratio, not cash flow multiples, not enterprise. It's just fund flows. So if you can jump on a gold ETF because there's a bunch of fund flows going those names, then those stocks go up not because they have value metrics that are attractive or growth metrics. They're just going up because fund flows are going into that index. Uh, and until and so we saw this in a microcosm uh, 18 months ago when all this money went to the GDXJ and all of a sudden they realized they bought 10 companies or something, I forget the exact number, of only more than 20% of a company in Canada, immediately they had to take over those companies. So by quarter end, in three days, they blew out all those stocks, like a billion dollars and $2 billion in uh, hitting all those bids. And they crushed those stocks and they basically create a rippling effect for all junior gold stocks. 
and then you get a bit of a finally cleansing of that, and we had it now that Vanguard is getting other gold business. And we were you know, cynical about it and, and, and disappointed that our gold fund, gold U.S. gold shares, outperformed the Vanguard mutual fund for a one, three, five, and 10-year periods. But it didn't matter. They were $2.5 billion or much bigger than us. We outperformed them. You know why? Because they're cheaper. 35 basis points versus 160 basis points, but we were outperforming and, and, and allegedly cheaper is better. Well, it's just not better if you're looking for performance, and it's just not better if you really get someone who's dedicated. So all these gold investors that went over there have been orphaned. And I think that those crowding into these uh, indexes and saying cheaper is better is a real flaw argument. And I think a lot of these RIAs have to look at their fiduciary and they have to do a balance of looking for performance. Yeah, that's very interesting that we have so much of that money going into these index funds. And, and obviously, a lot of money can go into it and a lot of money can come out of it at one time. And that could be a tipping point uh, when we do see that rebalancing that you talk about uh, maybe at the end of the year here. That's uh, that's going to be something to watch very closely. Those uh, great points. Uh, now, the metals are, are showing a little strength over the past week or two after nearly six months of, of pretty relentless selling. We've learned to keep our expectations low. Uh, we're going to need a catalyst to see any serious fireworks in the metals, it seems. What are you expecting for the metals as we head down the stretch in the fourth quarter? It sure would be nice if gold and silver could end the year in the green, but it's pretty ambitious at this point, perhaps. Uh, gold needs to rise another $100 an ounce and silver about $2 and a quarter. What, what do you think? Can we pull that off? Yeah, I think if uh, we get something economic saying the economy slowing down dramatically, then rates start coming off. That will take the dollar down and gold will surge. Well, I thought it was interesting that with Turkey, with all of its poor policies and religious-based social policies over uh, economic policies, that they've had to sell gold. And what was the real interesting part with that whole uh, thesis was Poland out of nowhere, Poland shows up and has got a bid for $6 billion worth of gold. I mean, that was really uh, a positive shock to the uh, system. But what has happened around the world is that many of these countries like Czech, Hungary, and Poland, they've basically voted in a more fiscally conservative leadership, both from their prime ministers and presidents. So I think that they're witnessing this whole printing. And in Europe, they basically vaporized $1 trillion of non-performing loans that their central government bank basically bought all these uh, loans and Sent them into money heaven, the basement of the countries of the of all these countries' currencies, and you're seeing more conservative people that are highly educated, like in Poland, buying gold as a reserve. So I, I think there's some positive parts in, in light of all of this. I remain constructive. I've always advocated the golden rule, and that golden rule is 10% in gold, and make sure you have that 10% and rebalance. And make sure if you're going to go rebalance your portfolio at this quarter end, that you do it not starting in January. You start it uh, before year end because you could get this huge uh, correction taking place like we had going from 1999 to 2000. You recently reported about the announcement of a huge merger between mining giant Barrick Gold and Rand Gold Resources, who will complete a, an $18 billion merger that will create the world's largest gold producer. Talk about why you think this may be a significant for metals prices in the months and years ahead. I thought your comments about that were pretty interesting in that uh, recent Frank Talk piece. Well, one of the things that's um, tickling me is that uh, we were the original seed shareholders of Rand Gold a little less than 30 years ago. We seeded that company. Mark Bristow's vision, who has a PhD in the, in the platinum belt in South Africa, but it's looking at the greenstones in West Africa where the great opportunities were. And he's very focused on return on investor capital, and he's very focused on revenue per share and cash flow per share growth metrics, unlike many of the other majors. And now he is the largest gold mining company in the world. He is a frugal guy, and you will see him go in there to cut costs everywhere to let the shareholders have a higher return on invested capital. And I think that that's the whole concept there is this new discipline coming into the gold space. And I think the last time we had mega mergers like this to save on costs was at the bottom in 2000 and 2001, 2002. There was uh, several major M&A work that was done to uh, have uh, stronger economies of scale. So that's very positive for gold stocks. 
And the last thing to share with you is that this whole thing with Vanguard's gold fund now leaving and taking the word out, they blew out $2 billion of gold stocks in the past month. And that really hurt the overall P.E. ratios, cash flow ratios that make a lot of these gold stocks much cheaper and more attractive than the overall market. And I think that that's something that investors have to be aware of. Gold stocks are like bullion and silver are a great buys. That's one reason why we created GoAU, our smart beta, our quant approach to picking gold ETFs to compete with the uh, ETFs out there like the GDX and GDXJ. And uh, it's doing exactly what that quant model said it would do. It's far outperforming uh, the GDX and GDXJ in its first year of performance. And interesting enough, we had a big turnover this quarter on the rebalancing, something like 12 names. And why was that? Because a lot of stocks got compressed because of this blowout by Vanguard. They all of a sudden populated as being extremely undervalued. And any pop in the price of gold, these stocks will give you not only probably a three to one ratio rise, maybe five or six. So we remain constructively positive on the industry and do believe that we have peak gold. We do really believe that we're in that throes and uh, there's no new technological breakthrough like we had last time. We had peak oil. The frackers came along and with technology we're able to reverse that. There's nothing for gold. So stay tuned to this, to this station and remember the 10% golden rule. Well put. Yeah, obviously the whole Vanguard thing is quite troubling and people that have their money there should probably be thinking twice. I know that's not something Frank wants to say, but I'll, but I'll say it. <laughs> and it's a good thing that we have uh, folks like U.S. Global Investors out there who can uh, serve the public well when it comes to, to that space. Well, uh, finally, Frank, as we begin to wrap up, give us any final thoughts here and give our listeners an idea of maybe some of those key data points or geopolitical events or market events that you're uh, going to be watching most closely in the near term that, that you believe will move the markets or anything else you want to hit on before we say goodbye? You just make sure that you're balanced. The big part is you have income, uh, short-term munis, short-term uh, government bond uh, funds, to so just make sure your overall portfolio is balanced. Not everyone jumping in at the top and feeling they've got FOMO. I heard this expression, you know, fear of missing out was a big issue for millennials. Well, it also is for old guys like me in the stock market that say, I better jump in now. I've missed this big move in Amazon. Do not make investment decisions based on FOMO. <laughs> yeah, good uh, good point. I'll have to use that uh, FOMO. I have not heard that term. <laughs> the millennials use it. I can see why. Well, uh, we appreciate the time as always, Frank, and we look forward to more of your great commentaries about the metals and the markets over the next few months of the year. And we certainly look forward to dissecting some of those during our next conversation. Uh, but before we let you go, please tell our listeners a little bit more about your firm and your services and anything else people ought to know about you or U.S. Global Investors. Well, thank you. Well, it's uh, usfunds.com, U.S. funds, like money, usfunds.com. Go there, check out the investor alert. We have uh, tens of thousands of readers in 180 countries. We write every week about the capital markets and different asset classes and do a game film analysis. And then there's Frank Talk about my global travels to take a look at uh, my experiences of traveling around the world. You can be involved with uh, our journey through investments. Well, it's excellent stuff. Definitely urge people to uh, check that out. We've always enjoyed the information there and, and then also talking to you about that work here on our podcast. Uh, thanks again, Frank. Enjoy the fall and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Take care. Well, that will do it for this week. Thanks again to Frank Holmes, CEO of U.S. Global Investors and manager of the GoAU Gold Fund. For more information, the site is usfunds.com. Be sure to check out the previously mentioned Frank Talk blog while you're there for some of the best market commentary you'll find anywhere on gold and other related topics. Again, you can find all of that at usfunds.com. And check back here next Friday for our next weekly market wrap podcast. Until then, this has been Mike Leaston with Money Metals Exchange. Thanks for listening and have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's Money Metals podcast. Be sure to come back next week. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes for answers to all of your questions or to discreetly and securely buy or sell gold or silver coins, bars, and rounds. Call 1-800-800-1865 or visit www.moneymetals.com. Our knowledgeable and no-pressure specialists are standing by between 7 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Friday. Or you can lock in your order online 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. 
Again, visit us at www.moneymetals.com or call 1-800-800-1865. 